Hi, I'm Jenny Brocky. Tonight on Insight, how sick can you get from a tick? You were bitten by a tick, and what happened after that? I said, I can't see, and I just went down. That was it. What did you have? Uh, Lyme disease. Yeah, I got really ill at Wimbledon earlier in the year. Would you prefer a wrong diagnosis to no diagnosis? The people that are sick need the action. They don't need the words. But first, we must do no harm. Welcome, everybody. Good to have you here. Uh, Vivian, you were bitten by a tick while you were bushwalking on the south coast last year. What happened after that? Well, my friend Julie got the whole tick out and we were very pleased with that because we thought, great, we've got the head out, fine. And what happened after that? About three minutes after that, I felt very warm and I said, I'm... I don't, I don't feel so good. And I said, I can't see. And I just went down. That was it. Mm. Julie, you, what happened at the time? All of a sudden she just did a huge vomit and then went <laughs> unconscious. Um, we popped her on her side and rang AAA straight away. And the ambulance came within five or ten minutes, which was fabulous. How sick was she? We, um, Jackie, my friend, couldn't feel a pulse. Um, mm. We were pretty worried, actually. <laughs> yeah. mm. Mm. How long did it take for you to recover from that? Well, the ambulance came and they put quite a lot of adrenaline into me. So, um, and then I went to hospital overnight with a steroid drip. But after that, I was fine. And what did they tell you had happened? What did they tell you? They said that, that I'd that had reaction? an extreme anaphylactic reaction to the yeah. tick bite. Yeah, because there were no hives, no rash, no shortness of breath, no throat swelling, nothing. And I'd had ticks before, plenty of times in my life, with no particular reaction. Mm. How do you feel about ticks now? Because my, my anaphylaxis is so extreme, even a tiny baby tick will have a very serious, uh, possibly fatal effect. So now I can't... Uh, I'm concerned about living on the east coast of Australia where the, where the paralysis tick is endemic. So that's meant that I've left my house, my family, my friends, and I'm searching for somewhere that's safe for me to live. And where might that be? Um, I think the band of, um, of 30 kilometres down the east coast of Australia and large parts of Victoria have that particular tick, and so anywhere that's not there. <laughs> Were you given an explanation as to why you could have been bitten by ticks before and not had a reaction, but this time you did? I think, to me, it's, it's quite random. Um, it, it, it's a mysterious thing. Ticks are very strange and mysterious creatures, yeah. Ella, you're 16. You had an anaphylactic reaction at a Halloween party last year. What caused the reaction? Um, well, earlier that night I'd gotten ready with my friends at a friend's house and we'd had some food before while we were getting ready and I had four chips and her mum had turned steak beforehand and accidentally turned the chips with the same tongs and three hours later at the party my lips were kind of swollen and I went into the bathroom and just looked in the mirror I'm like, oh, oh. Gosh, I'm having an anaphylactic reaction. Had you had that before? Um, I'd had a mild one earlier. To like, meat? To meat, yes. Because mm. it used to be just hives. But gradually it got worse and I became more sensitive. Mm. So what happened to you this night? Did you have an EpiPen to I, use? Yeah, did, I had an EpiPen with did me. Did you use it? No. <laughs> Why didn't you use it? I don't, I don't know. I guess I kind of thought that I was going to be all right and that I'd make it to the hospital in time and I didn't really, I've, I hate needles, like mm. I, needles terrify me, mm. so it was kind of also the fact of using a needle wasn't very appealing to me, <laughs> I guess, but yeah. What other foods and products are you allergic to apart from 
red meat. Is it red meat or it's all meat? It's red meat. It's pork. red meat. Yeah. Mm. But I'm also allergic to all mammal products. So that means that I can't have dairy products, goat milk, cheese milk. But I think having the allergy, it's, it's frustrating and it's hard. Shelley, you're Ella's mum. How long has she had these allergies? Um, around the age of three to four, um, I knew that there were significant problems and we went from doctor to doctor to specialist to specialist and the, the most hopeful advice we got at that age was to keep a food diary. But the reaction seemed so random. So mm. on one day it might be to pork, on another day it might be to ice cream and so on and so on and so on. And then we ended up seeing a wonderful uh, GP in Manly that suggested that um, her anaphylaxis trip to hospital um, perhaps m might have that link with the red meat allergy that had been recently um, discovered and written about in journals by the professor. So mm. he recommended that we go and, and see her. Um, and what were you told caused that red meat allergy? Tick bites. So she went to a preschool in Terry Hills on the Northern Beaches and she um, used to get bitten by ticks there a lot and the last day she spent there I stopped counting at 60. Mm. Oh. So significant, um, yeah, significant tick issues. Mm -hmm. And so a direct link was drawn? No, not immediately. It took a long time to, a long time before, yeah, tens of thousands of dollars and visits. Mm -hmm. Cheryl, you're a clinical immunologist and an allergist. Is there a name for Ella's allergy? Well, there are about over a thousand people in the northern part of Sydney who suffer from mammalian meat allergy after tick bite. Now, you discovered this connection, is that right? That's correct. How did you discover that connection? In one of the tricky parts of mammalian meat allergy is that it's two to ten hours after people consume the meat mm. and so the connection had been difficult for people to make but it started becoming more common after around 2003 and I'd seen probably in excess of 50 people then and it impressed me that everybody had been bitten by a tick who had this so yeah. this obviously doesn't happen to everybody no. um, who gets bit by a tick, but how soon after people are bitten by ticks does this allergy show up? Usually it takes around a month. Sometimes it's much longer. Um, Craig, you've been a gardener around the northern beaches of Sydney for 27 years. Now that's an area notorious mm. for ticks. Um, when were you last bitten by a tick? I was bitten probably a couple of weeks ago. Um, I usually find them crawling on me at first because I'm quite sensitive to them. I mean, I've been bitten over those 27 years, even as a child, I think, but um, How many about... times would you have been bitten, do you think? Oh, it's hard to say because you, you might get a, a paralysis tick, which is quite large and singular on you, whereas you might walk through a swathe of grass ticks, which are the nymph developmental stage of, of the, you know, the paralysis tick. So you might have 40 or 50 crawling on your legs, um, which I've had before. Do you get sick? I've been sick a few times. I've had tick typhus a couple of times. Um, the first time was quite acute and had really bad sort of fevers and cold sweats, uh, headaches, sensitive to light. Um, and the only thing that sort of drew me to it was I, I, it didn't, didn't go, it was just persistent. And I thought, oh, this is the worst you know, flu I've ever had. So I just went down to the GP and he said, well, let's get you onto the antibiotic, which was doxycycline, which is an anti-malarial. Um, and... How long did you take that for? Ten days, the course is. Mm -hmm. And afterwards? Fine. Miles, you're an infectious disease specialist. What illnesses do we know tick bites can cause in Australia? Oh, well, on the East Coast, the commonest one is uh, what we used to call Queensland tick typhus, but is now generally called uh, Australian spotted fever because we have subsequently recognised cases Sydney uh, and Victoria. Um, there's also uh, a new rickettsia uh, which uh, uh, the chap sitting next to me was involved in the discovery of uh, uh, called Flinders Island uh, spotted fever which is also a spotted fever group rickettsia and there are... What's rare... a rickettsia? Rickettsia are uh, tick transmitted organisms. 
Right, so there are a number of illnesses we know, and everyone agrees, are caused by ticks. That's correct. And, yeah. and we also know that ticks are full of lots of uh, other organisms. What we don't know is whether they cause disease in humans. So that link hasn't been made. Mm. Um, and when we, talk, when we talk about ticks, how many different types of ticks are they and can they all cause these problems? Uh, well, there are dozens of ticks in Australia, many of them imported and not um, native to Australia, but very few of them actually bite humans. All right. Uh, Cheryl, I think at, at this point everyone is going to want to know what, what do you do if you find a tick lodged on your body? So the first thing is if you live in a tick endemic area, don't scratch anything you can't see because it could be a tick. If you have a tick, don't disturb the tick. Because she, because she will squirt allergen into you at that point. You are she. Getting, she, <laughs> she. She is trying to make her two and a half to 3,000 babies and you are getting in the way if you disturb her. So don't grab don't, the tweezers. Don't disturb the tick. Don't use anything that's going to compress the tick. Basically, kill the tick where it is. How? So if ah. it's a small tick, a larval tick or a nymph stage tick, Use Lyclear, so just drop the cream onto the top. Don't use rub it in. Use what? Lyclear, it's a cream used for scabies. If you haven't got your Lyclear, what can you do? Leave the tick alone. So go to the hospital or go That's to the doctor? That's right. Or... That's right. Mm. So tend your general practice or go to the emergency department. Um, yeah. And then if you've put the Lyclear on the tick, Leave what do you do then? Leave it for one to three hours. The tick will then be dead and then you can safely scrape it off, say shave it or whatever. So with an adult tick, what we like you to do is to get about half a centimetre above and hit it with a freezing agent because that kills it instantly and she can't mm. squirt then. Whatever you do, don't use household tweezers. They're too thick. What is a freezing agent? What, for, freezing for... agents <coughs> are ether containing. They're used for skin tags and for wart removal. But mm. if you do have a tick, then don't touch it. Kill it. Don't squeeze it. And it all should be well. Sam Stoza, you're uh, Australia's top women's tennis player, um, but you became very ill in 2007 mm -hmm. and your game suffered as a result. Let's have a look. Stoza breaking in the very first game to take a 3-1 lead and then falling in a heap. The 29th seed, who has been sidelined for almost two months with the measles, collapsing in straight sets 6-3, 6-2. Oh. So with unforced error number 30... Mm, you didn't have measles. What did you have? No. Uh, Lyme disease, but I didn't know at that point. So, um, yeah, I got really ill at Wimbledon earlier in the year, so in June, and I uh, thought I could go back to the States and play, and as it turns out, I could. I knew I wasn't going to win that match after about three games. Mm. Now, Lyme disease is caused by uh, tick DT. bites. Yep. Um, how long did it take for you to get the right diagnosis? You were overseas at the time. Uh, so I went over there, played... And by the end of that week, I um, ended up with meningitis and in hospital. And then I ended up staying in the States for another couple of months until they diagnosed me, uh, yeah, with Lyme. Mm. And why was it so hard to get the diagnosis? Uh, well, I think because, I, I mean, I was in three different continents. So I started in, <laughs> in England, uh, in the UK, and then came back to Australia. And it's not recognised here, so that was never even on the radar. And... Um, yeah, as it turns out, it was a very good decision to go back to America and try and play. And Where do you think you got it? I think I got it in Paris. I just, I don't know. But you, you can get bitten and not feel anything for up to 10 months. So I'm kind of guessing at that. And in the end, you know, once it was diagnosed in mm -hmm. America, w was there any doubt about, about what it was? No, the uh, infectious disease specialist that I went and saw, once he put all my symptoms together... Um, how, how, what I'd felt, how long, um, once I had the meningitis, that was all kind of, and then all the tests, blood tests and everything that I had done, once he put all that together, he was pretty adamant that I definitely had Lyme and that's what he was going to treat me for. So the test results came back showing positive to Lyme disease? There's no test to say you've actually got Lyme, but putting whatever all these other things are <laughs> together and all my symptoms, that's what he'd come up with. Mm. And were you training during all this period? Were you still trying to play? Yeah, well, I played in New York and I, I just started with my coach, actually. So he's like, hey, you just got to get fit. 
got to get you back. And um, so that's what we were doing. And then I, I got really sick one night and had lots of chest pains and went to hospital. Um, they couldn't tell me what was wrong. And then a few days later, that's, I flew back to where I based myself in Florida and um, had this pounding headache. And the first hospital I went to told me I had sinusitis, which I was convinced I did not have. Um, but went home and about 24 hours later went back to hospital and they did a spinal tap and that's where they said that I had viral meningitis and then from there then we could kind of, once I was over that, then that's when I started to see the specialist. Mm. Miles, what is Lyme disease? Well, Lyme disease is a um, infection by a uh, Borrelia burgdorferi group and the transmission is by a tick bite uh, and this is endemic in North America uh, Europe, um, Asia, uh, and probably cases down as far as Thailand, but that's as far as it's been proven to extend. Um, and what and are the symptoms? The symptoms uh, are in several stages, uh, depending on when you're diagnosed, but it's generally broken down into early and late Lyme disease. Uh, and if the diagnosis isn't made at that stage, the bug can spread to other organs, uh, including uh, the uh, lining of the brain, menin meninges, uh, the heart, um, the nerves, uh, particularly in the uh, in the head region, cranial neuritis we call it, uh, and then to joints, uh, and it can even infect the brain itself, which is called encephalitis, and that's the hardest to treat form of uh, Lyme disease. Have you ever diagnosed someone in Australia with Lyme disease acquired here? Not acquired here, no, I've uh, diagnosed a number of cases acquired overseas. So do you think Lyme disease exists here? Well, I don't have to think because medicine actually operates on scientific principles. So the question is, what is the data? And as I say, multiple um, investigators have looked into this question, looking for the uh, organism in ticks, what we call reservoir animals and human beings and there's been no definitive proof of them in Australia. In all the other countries that we've discussed, it's very easy to find the organism. So if you have endemic Lyme disease, you can find the organism anywhere you look, in the ticks, in the animals, or the human beings. But not here? Not here. The people that are sick need the action. They don't need the words. But first we must do no harm. Excellent, great. So, so, if, I, so if I die on your watch, is that doing no harm? Jesse, you were on a beach on the central coast a couple of years ago when something unusual happened. What happened? Absolutely. I was um, on the central coast. We were just hanging out with the family. Um, we'd walk past a, a marsh and some bushland and stuff to get to some sand dunes. And um, my wife actually went back to the car because she didn't enjoy the bugs that were um, present. Um, there was sand flies and there was um, little bugs crawling on our feet and stuff like that. And we. We just sort of shook it off, had a bit of a play, and then we went back to the cars and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so. Mm. And did you notice anything had bitten you or? Not at the time. They were, they were very small and they were um, creepy crawly. Um, and yeah, we just brushed them off and went on our merry way. And what happened about a week after that? So I, w I took a flight to New Zealand and um, as soon as I got to New Zealand, I was um, starting to get sick. I got very, very ill, spent most of my 10 days in the bottom of the shower, um, fevers, chills, um, fatigue, all sorts of things like that. I went and saw um, New Zealand doctors. I got tested for all sorts of things and they couldn't find anything that was, that was causing the issue and yet I was, I was just chronically sick. It was nasty. How long did those symptoms last? Um, so they started subsiding after about 10, 10 days. Um, and then when I got back to Australia, like I could never really actually shake it. I, I started having um, even more and more symptoms that would start accumulating. Um, I'd start having headaches. Um, I'd have fatigue. I'd have um, muscle aches, pains, um, to the point where I could barely get out of bed. Um, I was um, also like having stomach and digestion problems, chronic diarrhea, all sorts of things that were just not, not normal, and I, I started seeing doctors. How many doctors? I saw um, somewhere between um, 16 and 19 doctors that just 
kept telling me there's, there's nothing wrong with you or you need to take probiotics or, you know, your immune system's just low at the moment or you need to see a psychiatrist was the last one that I, that I had that I started um, getting quite upset with him. <laughs> and, yeah. How long had it been going on at this point? So I, I saw doctors for about nine months. What did you do eventually? So eventually I was told um, by one doctor, oh, I think you need to um, you know, go and see a chronic fatigue specialist. And then the chronic fatigue doctor said, uh, I don't think you've got um, chronic fatigue. I think you've got uh, a Lyme-like illness. A Lyme-like illness or a li yeah, or no, Lyme said, disease? He said a Lyme-like illness. Chanel, you're 17. When were you told by a GP here in Australia that you had Lyme disease? Um, it was, was it a year or two ago? Yeah, it was 2013. And what were your symptoms? Um, I was fatigued, I had lots of, lot of headaches, stomach pains, um, muscle pain. Um, and how long had that been going on? About five years. Five years you'd had those symptoms? And had you been to many doctors yeah. about them? Kate, you're Chanel's mum. When did the idea of Lyme disease come into the picture here with Chanel? Yeah, well, it was about six years after she first started getting her symptoms. Um, we were f fishing around for about three years trying to get a diagnosis with no luck um, on the Sunshine Coast. And... Um, we weren't getting anywhere with that, so we um, went to see a holistic GP in Sydney. So when did Lyme disease get raised? Uh, he did ask if she had ever been bitten by a tick. So I guess at that stage he probably had an idea that maybe uh, that could have been a reason why. So when the doctor said that he thought she had Lyme disease. This was before any testing or anything yeah, like that? it was a clinical examination. Mm. Yeah. And he, he just suspected it. What did doctors say to you? Because a lot of doctors didn't believe you, did they? No, they don't, no. Um, I, I guess with so many different symptoms, uh, they would just sort of come to the um, conclusion that, that she was making it up. Or that, or that I was making it mm. up. Or we were both making it up because we wanted to, you know, no one wants this. No one wants to be sick with this. It's, it's, it's debilitating and it's horrible. So I wouldn't wish it on anyone. So why they think we're making it up, I have no idea. Why are you so convinced though that she has Lyme disease and not something else when the science is saying Lyme disease doesn't exist here? Yeah. We had been everywhere. We had been to every specialist. So when we finally got a diagnosis, it was, it was a sort of a relief to think that we could start treating her. Okay. Can I get a reaction from some, <laughs> yeah, of, the, yeah, absolutely. some of the doctors here? <laughs> well, it's very interesting to hear that. And I'm, I'm sorry your daughter's been sick for so long, but it's probably not Lyme disease, to be quite honest, unless she's travelled overseas to a Lyme endemic area. Uh, call it what you really... want. It's, it's a bacteria that's in her system. We don't call it Lyme. Mm. Well, there are things in ticks that can make people sick, and certainly rickettsial diseases, which we've discussed earlier, they can have a long uh, post-infectious sequelae involving fatigue and strange symptoms of pain, and headache, muscle pains and things like that. So that, that is recognised. But there may, in fact, be other uh, illnesses that have not yet been diagnosed that are associated with ticks. But we're saying you almost certainly haven't got Lyme disease because all the studies that have been done, there have now been four large studies done over the last 20 years looking at many, many ticks in Australia, thousands of ticks, and none of them have found Lyme disease bacteria in the ticks. You've had doctors tell you you've got Lyme disease, right? I've, I've, had, I've had doctors tell me that I have a Lyme-like like disease and I, I agree completely. I think that there is a, a disease that is out there that is um, Lyme-like. It, it has similar symptoms to Lyme. It has um, similar features to Lyme and I think some of the co-infections are probably there as well. Okay, so there's agreement then because this is a well, ferocious except, uh, debate around, Lyme around Lyme, -like, Lyme disease. Using the term Lyme-like actually has inhibited the studies because it's made people Focus, focus on looking on for this organism which 
we know is not present in Australia. There may be other organisms, but we haven't been looking at them because everybody is talking about Lyme-like or Lyme disease. Mm. It's and taking us down are, a, a sidetrack. Why are people, if, 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 as you say, the science is, is you know, suggesting that the Lyme disease that we're seeing in the rest of the world doesn't exist here, why are people in Australia being told by Australian GPs they have Lyme disease? Well, firstly, they're not specialists in infectious diseases. So uh, um, they're extrapolating from an overseas experience and assuming it's the same thing. And, and there's a whole series of deductions which haven't been proven along the way. So that's why we have to address this with an open mind. Yes, there's illness in the community. We don't know uh, much about it. We need to study it in a scientific manner. Can okay. I? Can so, I get a reaction from you? Can I just say, I think it's the scientist's job to start with to do that. And as a mother of a very sick child for a very long amount of time, I, I just want someone to, to make her better. Yep, Jessie. I, I don't think anybody really cares what we call it. Like, you can call it whatever you want, yeah. but you need to study it and you need to hurry up about it. Yeah. Because, I mean, my, my dog has technology to actually protect from ticks, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Gail, you're a GP on the New South Wales Mid-North Coast. You've been associated with diagnosing Australians with Lyme disease on the basis of tick bites here. Do you think it exists in Australia? No, I don't think Lyme disease exists in Australia for the reasons that Miles um, mentions. Um, but I have... Um, I see a lot of people with similar stories to the stories we're hearing now, and there are many people who have got illnesses that are comparable to what is known in the United States anyway as chronic Lyme disease by some. But have just slightly taking issue with what Miles said about everybody knowing what Lyme disease is. In the States, there's a kind of two camps. There is chronic Lyme disease, there's not chronic Lyme disease. But the, the sort of stories that we're talking about are people having been sick for, well, months to years, perhaps even a decade or, or longer. Um, and doctors who work like me, we often see diseases that don't have a conventional medical diagnosis and are often quite complicated. And what the way that I got into inverted commas Lyme or Lyme-like disease was trying to tease out what's going on for these people. And someone actually came to me and said they'd been diagnosed with Lyme disease. So what do you think then of doctors diagnosing people with Lyme disease in Australia? Well, I think it's really, it's, it's kind of a, um, it's a misnomer. As, as Miles said, I agree. I don't think we should use that term. We know there are things, there are organisms that get into us that sometimes make us sick right at the beginning, and that's really relatively easy to pick up. But there are also, it's, we know there are other organisms that get into us that cause infections over the long term. And if we in Australia as health professionals use the term Lyme disease, then there are others reasonably would say, no, it's not Lyme disease. It can't be because there isn't Lyme disease in Australia. And it diverts attention from the sick person. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the big problem. Mm -hmm. Yes, Stephen. Yes, look, Carl, Gull's correct. There are a lot of infections that after the patient has an acute illness and thinks they've got over it, it actually drags on. And we see it in lots of, lots of illnesses. So it's quite a common phenomenon and it's not related specifically to any one type of infection. It's, it's to do with the patient's immune system. It's probably their immune system reacting in an aberrant way to the type of infection, whatever that infection was, that they got from the tick bite. Mm. Um, how did your doctor confirm your diagnosis, Jesse? So I had a, a test done through Igenix in America after my mum convinced me to do it because I, I was cash strapped after battling the, this, this whatever I had for nine or, nine or 12 months by that time. How much did the test cost? It was two and a half thousand dollars. And what did the test show? Um, so it showed that I was, I, I was actually shocked by it. I was, it said it was positive for something called Babesia, um, for another one called HM, HME, and then Duncani as well. And what did that mean? What did, what did that effectively mean in it, terms of it, what you had? It effectively meant I had three um, active co-infections. And they were Lyme-related? They're Lyme-related. They're co-infections to Lyme disease. Hmm. So was the conclusion that your doctor reached that you had Lyme disease? Well, he said Lyme-like illness and we're treating it as a Lyme-like illness and the, the... So that means treating it like Lyme disease? Yes, I would say, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Do you want me to clarify that? Yeah. I'm, I'm in a position to do so, sure. having worked in that area a bit. So the, well, you can't clarify his case. No, because, no, but I can clarify that doctor. sort. No, but those, those sort of results. So those three things that were positive on the test results were are three different infectious organisms, or two, because it might be Babesia duncani, which is yep. one organism. And then it's not that they're Lyme. They're not related to Lyme. They're also organisms that can be carried by ticks, and then and they can also cause disease in human beings, and they can be tested for and Igenex does some testing for it, and then it's up to the doctor to make an interpretation of those results and the symptoms of the patient and decide, is there a match? And then, based on the clinical decision and the patient's preference, work out a treatment plan. Okay, Chanel, where were you tested? How were you tested? Um, I think it was the same. Yeah, uh, her first blood test was sent to Australian Biologics in Sydney, and they came back uh, with a positive for Borreliosis. Which is? Which is the bacteria that is found in similar Lyme-like disease. And also um, her bloods were also sent to Igenix as well. Mm. And how much did that cost? Uh, up, all up, over $3,000, $4,000. Stephen, what do you think of these tests? Well, most of the tests are looking for antibodies in the patient's blood antibodies that have been stimulated by the patient's immune system. So we've all got antibodies in our blood to all the microbes we've been exposed to in the last six months or so. Now, just because I suddenly feel unwell and he suddenly finds an antibody to something in my blood, it doesn't mean they're connected. Right. So you're saying you can't draw firm conclusions from those tests? Yeah. If you want to do it properly, looking at antibodies, you've got to show a negative to positive change over time, and that's called a seroconversion, or you've got to show a change in antibody level from low to high over a, a period of days or weeks. And they are the only two ways you can be sure that an antibody test is, di is, is connected with the patient's illness. Mm -hmm. Would you prefer a wrong diagnosis to no diagnosis? That's really the but issue. But if that diagnosis leads them or the patient, like my husband, on a path of treatment, which is the same as Lyme disease, and getting successful results, does it matter what you call it if the same method is achieving a positive result? No, in that, that patient, no, it doesn't. Mm. The, the object is to get the patient better. So, but often patients are treated for undiagnosed illnesses mm. by doctors and they get better anyway. And sometimes patients get better even without going to the doctor. Mm. You know, the, the medicine, if you, if you take it, you'll get better in seven days and if you don't take it, you'll get better in a week. Um, Jenny, you run the private lab in Australia that tested Chanel. You advertise Lyme testing. Why? We started looking um, for the DNA of Borrelia uh, in 2002. And if we hadn't found any, we probably would have stopped after a, maybe a year or so. However, we have continually been finding Borrelia. Now, Borrelia is the bacteria associated with yeah, Lyme disease, right? I and don't like the term Lyme either. We're not American. <laughs> and uh, I think it's been a complete furphy and it should never have been used. It's a Borrelia infection. But you're saying that you're finding... Absolutely. ..the bacteria... Yes. ..associated with Lyme disease... Yes. ..in your laboratory? Yes. Borrelia exists and we are finding Borrelia burgdorferi, which is the type of Borrelia. We find other types as well, but we certainly have sequenced Borrelia burgdorferi repeatedly. Is your lab accredited? Not yet. And I must raise another point about that. There is no legal requirement for a laboratory, testing humans or otherwise, to have accreditation unless you are applying for Medicare. Uh, response, Stephen. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry to have to say this, but I don't think that, that Jenny's correct. I think there's something get happening in her laboratory that's uh, re resulting in her getting what we call false positive reactions. I don't think that there is Borrelia burgdorferi in Australia. I don't know of any other laboratory that's getting positives uh, for Borrelia burgdorferi DNA. Jesse, why did you choose an American lab to get tested? Uh, because I'd heard that the, the testing in Australia wasn't as strong as the testing overseas, um, that the, the laboratories in Australia weren't as good as the ones that were, that were already dealing with these, these same vectors. Um, yeah, I, just, I think that we need a, a rapid test. Stephen, um, 
Yes, well, I can't disagree that we need a better testing. There's no question about that, but it just can't happen with a drop of a hat. There has to be money made available to do it, and that's one of the biggest weaknesses. We don't have enough money to do it. So, yes, you're right, and I understand why you felt the need to, to send to another laboratory, but you probably got the wrong result from that American laboratory. I don't think I did. It's up to you. Um, but do you think it could be something other than Lyme? I, I, I don't know, but... Um, I do know that, you know, the, the antibiotics have helped and they've helped drastically. Like, when I would stop taking the antibiotics, because I, I obviously don't want to be on antibiotics for, for the rest of my life, but every time I stop taking the antibiotics, the symptoms just, like, revert straight back to where they were. Um, even, even the rash on my feet comes back. Um, and it's the Lyme rash. I mean, it's, it's the rash that everybody... I think is... we've got a picture of your rash here. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's one. Um, and there's another one. You can see the, the ring on my foot there. So mm -hmm. it's... So that's um, the what's called the bullseye rash, I think, that's associated with Lyme's disease. Is that right? Many rashes look like that. It's not specific to, um, <laughs> to yeah. uh, erythema cool. chronicum. Can I ask you how long you've been taking your antibiotics for? Um, I've been taking them for about 9 to 12 months now. How many antibiotics are you taking? Um, three different varieties. OK. How long was Chanel on antibiotics for? She was on them for just over two years. Mm -hmm. This was a doctor prescribing antibiotics for two years. Yeah. Yep. And Which did they we work? We did see an immediate progress um, in her treatment, but unfortunately, um, Chanel's situation was a bit different in the fact that her body wasn't absorbing them. So after time, she just plateaued and um, things just sort of didn't get much better. Uh, so then that's when they do the IVs. Um, they put the intravenous antibiotics, yes, intravenous antibiotics into the bloodstream, which has a, a different effect, I, I imagine. Did you have intravenous antibiotics? No, I didn't. No. Mm. And Sam, oh, you did? Yeah, I did two weeks of oral. One, they were still waiting for test results. And then as soon as they came back and he put all the bits together, then I went on four weeks of IV and another two weeks of oral afterwards. So that's more the standard yeah. treatment I'm for Lyme disease about, overseas. I'm not talking about Sam's treatment, but these very prolonged therapy with multiple antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Firstly, as Stephen's already mentioned, there have been a number of trials to show that that actually doesn't change the outcome of the patient. The second thing is, is they are potentially uh, very uh, toxic and there have been deaths uh, associated with uh, uh, um, unrequired uh, uh, intravenous therapy. Yep, and the other issue that everyone needs to be aware of is the rising antibiotic resistance of bacteria. Mm -hmm. If people are taking antibiotics for such a long time, their bacteria are going to become resistant to those antibiotics after a relatively short time. Kate, you say that Chanel was taking up to 200 pills a week? Yep. Oh. yep. Um, so how did you get her to take that many pills? Uh, in the beginning, it was very difficult and um, she would vomit a lot of them back up again. Um, but over the time, she just became used to it and it started to make her feel a bit better, so she knew that. Jesse, you're currently taking a high dose of oral antibiotics still? Yeah, look, I'm, I'm still taking it. Do you worry about taking them for that long? Yeah, I do. I, I think it's, I mean, it's obviously got to cause damage, it's got to cause toxicity, but, I mean, what alternative do I have? If you give me an alternative, I'm happy to take it. Miles, I mean, what do you say to, to Jesse, who says, give me a better option? I think you have to be honest with patients. The first principle of medicine is non-maleficence. That means first do no harm. So don't give people false hope. Don't propose unapproved therapy which are potentially toxic. You've got to be honest and say, I acknowledge your illness. I don't know what it is. Nobody knows what it is at the moment. The symptoms that you have uh, have some similarities between a number of other syndromes we have. Uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia. We know there are some treatments which uh, help with the symptoms with those, so I would uh, proceed to treat them along those lines. Kate, earlier this year you took Chanel to Malaysia twice for what's called hypothermia treatment and blood ozone treatment. What does that involve? Yeah, all right. So um, basically the machine heats the body up to a very high temperature. That's the only thing that can um, kill the bacteria that's in their system. How high a temperature does it 42 degrees. The body. Who recommended this treatment? Uh, it's recommended by a lot of people who have already been there and done it and have found to have some amazing effects and um, successful treatments and have gone back to the normal selves again after the body is killed of 
the bacteria and it also is in combination with um, IV antibiotics at the time um, for about what a week afterwards. What convinced you to do it? What, what made you We're think at the end of, our, end of our line really with Chanel. She was fading away, she wasn't eating, uh, she was probably on death, death's door. So we had, I had to do something aggressive and um, we organised a local fundraiser to raise some funds to, to go over to Malaysia for two treatments. What was it like for you, Chanel, that treatment? Um, well, the first time um, afterwards, it was, it was horrible. I started getting the symptoms back pretty aggressively and um, I spent a week there with um, nutrients and a couple of weeks later, um, I was starting to feel better. And then the second one, which was that one, I felt better straight away. And how much did that treatment cost? The treatment cost $5,000. Or well, actually, no, it was $4,000 for the actual treatment. But we did some, we incorporated some blood ozone treatment as well while we were over there. And what's blood ozone treatment? Uh, it, it's a purification of, of the blood, diseased blood. So they take, it's like a dialysis. They take blood out, uh, purify it. Um, there's probably scientific words to describe it and um, basically put it back into the body. Miles, what do you think of this sort of treatment? Unproven experimental therapy needs further study. Meanwhile, people are dying. Agreed. What else do you do with a sick child? And, and look at her now. She turned around 360 degrees after having the, the second treatment. She was, yeah, I mean... <laughs> The reason why we I'd do, recommend it to anyone. The reason why we do controlled clinical trials with a placebo arm is that many people get better no matter what you do. We can't prove that her intervention actually resulted in the outcome. I can. <laughs> and you, you can only prove that by scientific study in a proper manner. She's sitting here right next to me and she's as healthy as she was before she, was, um, before she got this disease. That's my evidence and that's all I need. This is what this argument gets down to over and over again, isn't it? It's, it's the idea that you know, people's experience is one thing and the science is, is something you know, that everybody is debating and discussing, but people are saying, well, this is my individual experience. I mean, what, what do we end up relying on, individual not... experience or do we well, rely on science? I think the audience science? also needs to appreciate that the doctors are also constrained if I prescribe an unapproved therapy to somebody and they uh, have a fatal reaction to that, the licensing authorities will firstly pull my licence. Secondly, my insurance company will say, well, your policy is null and void because you've uh, uh, not followed uh, uh, recognised therapy. So, you know, we also have limitations on what we can offer patients because mainstream medicine has to use approved therapies, proven therapies. I mean, we'd all like to have a little chemistry workshop uh, in the back and create uh, magic uh, cures, but we are constrained by the licensing authorities as well. Kate, did you think about the risk yeah, associated absolutely. with what you yeah. did? But I knew what the alternative was. And what, what did you think the alternative was? She wouldn't have been with us for much longer. What, you thought she was going to die? Of course she was. What, what, why did you think she was going to die? She wasn't eating. She was fading away to nothing. She was bedridden. Uh, the child hasn't been well enough to go to school for over three years. <laughs> did you think you were going to die, Chanel? Um, for me, the mental side of it, the <coughs> depression, I probably would have, but I would have done it myself. What we need is action, <coughs> and we don't have action. All we've got is words of people saying, you know, we're doing tests and studies and this. I mean, the people that are sick need the action. They don't need the words. The but first we must do no harm. Excellent. Great. Give, giving you so, a, so, if giving I, you a so if I die on your is watch, is that doing you. no harm? But can you also understand why, you know, doctors are saying that they want to have enough evidence to be sure that what they are doing is no harm? Absolutely. I'm the first person to say we need a rapid test that we can, you know, give you at a GP's office and say, yes, you have this. No, you don't have this. 
Well, there just, there just has to be more resources put into it. It's as simple as that, because there are laboratories around Australia that will do that and can do that, but they haven't got the financial resources to do it. It's as simple as that. OK, Sam, we've got some footage here. I didn't just want to show you collapsing playing tennis. Um, we've got some footage here of you winning the US Open in 2011, which I'm sure you'll love to play. see. It's a good one. Um, this was about four years after your Lyme diagnosis. So that was four years later. How mm -hmm. long did it take for you to get to a point where you were actually feeling more like yourself again? Um, a good few months. And then I was in the States doing all my treatment. So eventually when the doctors told me it was okay for me to come home, I came home and uh, started really slowly with my training again, uh, which was about a 20 minute walk. So it was about 10 months from when I, um, first really noticed something to them when I was back mm. uh, competing again. What's it like for you hearing this discussion about whether or not Lyme disease exists in Australia or a Lyme-like illness and about some of the treatments people are having that aren't mm. the standard treatment that you had? I think I'm very lucky. <laughs> um, I think I'm very lucky that uh, I ended up going back to America. Um, whether or not, you know, they obviously acknowledge that there is Lyme here but you contract it overseas so that would have been my scenario, but um, I just feel like everything is a little bit more progressive away from Australia as far as that goes. How are you now? I'm great. Do most people make a full recovery from Lyme disease if they have it overseas? Yes, the overwhelming majority. Because this debate about, about Lyme disease is, is so prevalent around the question of ticks, is there a danger that other serious illnesses might be being overlooked? I mean, the answer is yes, there's a danger. Little is actually known about what Australian ticks have inside them in regards to uh, their pathogen potential. So we're going out into the bush to find ticks to see if we can identify potential pathogens that could be in these ticks. Well, let's spray ourselves first so we don't actually get bitten by any ticks. So when we go out looking for ticks, we're looking for them along dirt tracks and paths. OK, let's check them. So we can often use uh, a flag, uh, a piece of cloth that we can put across uh, the vegetation and that way we can also find the ticks. So Alex, I've actually found a male as well. So we've got... Oh, here we go. ..the we're... nymph, a female and a male. So when we're out in the bush and we come across a tick that we want to collect, then we put it into a tube of 70% ethanol and that kills the tick, and then we bring it back to the lab so we can identify it using morphological features of the tick. Uh, then we need to actually um, break up the tick, and by doing that, we actually um, freeze the tick so it's really cold and becomes very brittle. We then add uh, a ball bearing, and then we pulverize it into uh, a tick powder. So that powder contains tick, it also might contain blood from previous host and any potential pathogens. Then we go through um, a series of um, molecular techniques to amplify potential pathogens that could be in the tick. Ticks are known to cause illness in people all around the world and I wouldn't be surprised if we do find something that could be causing Australians when we're bitten by a ticks to become unwell. Charlotte, what have you found so far? And how long do you think it'll be before you know more about what diseases ticks might be carrying? So we have found five new bacterial species um, that are unique to Australian ticks. At the moment, we don't know if they can be transmitted by ticks let alone whether they can cause disease. And in those five new species, we have found a species of Borrelia, which is distantly related um, to any other Borrelia that we've, um, 
that is known. So we've talked about Borrelia tonight. We know Borrelia burgdorferi sensilato is the group that causes Lyme disease. There's also two other groups of Borrelia, and the Borrelia that we identified that was found in echidna ticks. So it's potentially a fourth group. So it's actually quite um, groundbreaking, fascinating research and findings that we actually got uh, a Borrelia that's actually unique to Australia. So does that mean that we could have a Lyme-like illness in Australia, potentially, well, because you found that Borrelia, those, those different types of Borrelia? Well, Lyme disease is associated with a specific um, group of, of Borrelia. Uh, whether, and we don't know if this Borrelia can be transmitted by ticks that actually bite humans. We've found other bacteria in ticks that have been removed from humans. So at the moment, we don't know if it can be transmitted or if it can cause disease. How much longer might it be before you know? I guess, you know, it's about, uh, as Stephen and Miles have talked about, it's about funding, it's about um, getting those funds so that we can actually do the research to help people like you if you're bitten by ticks and you're unwell. Defining what we're dealing with here is really important because it, it essentially, you know, has ramifications for treatment and all kinds of things. But one of the questions that I, I, I wanted to ask in summing up here is, with so much emphasis on whether or not Lyme exists in Australia, is there a danger to of overlooking other potential diseases that people might have or that, you know, th things that might be causing their symptoms because some doctors are quick to jump to a Lyme-like illness as the explanation goal? Do you think there's a danger oh, there? I think as it's happened. Um, I mean, the answer is yes, there's a danger. But like what I was trying to say before is let's stop talking about whether or not there's Lyme disease in Australia or not. Like we can, we can leave that to the guys who are looking in ticks to find what bugs we've got in ticks in Australia. What we need to do as health professionals is help the people that come and see us who say, I'm sick, can you help me? Um, but we make sure that we use all of our skills and all of our experience to help the patient get better. That's the most important thing. OK, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. It's been really good to, uh, to talk to all of you. And that is all we have time for here, but I'm sure you're going to want to keep talking about this on Twitter and on Facebook. We'll be back next week. Stay tuned now for Dateline. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>